And as you do, please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. As many of you know who were here with us several years ago when we went through the book of Ephesians, you know this is a packed chapter, just like many of the chapters in Ephesians are. And, um, but this morning, we're going to be concentrating our time specifically on verse 29. You see there in your, in your program. Um, it's, we're going to continue our series entitled, Real Godliness in Real Life. And uh, as a church, we spent the last six weeks, so we've been kind of walking through these things, these areas uh, in our life, and considering what it looks like to live out the Christian faith in daily life. That's what we've been considering as a church. Uh, and the goal of these messages really is for us, to, for our daily lives, to increasingly look like Jesus Christ, to be conformed to his image. And at some level, sometimes that feels like a vague, uh, far off, um, sometimes maybe even discouraging goal to have. Um, it's easy to think of godliness as a mystical ideal that's out there, a standard that we're consistently falling short of that leads, uh, that leads us with some degree of low-grade guilt. And it's tempting to wonder if we can make a little step in the right direction, let alone be able to make any kind of major progress in these areas of our lives. C.S. Lewis is quoted, I love it because it expresses a lot of my own experience. He says, no man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. And I, I just, that's my own experience a lot of times when I'm trying to, seeking to, to live these areas of my life out, real godliness in my life. And so, so the question comes to mind, if that's our temptation, where do we turn? Where do we go to find hope in these instances? If we're, if we're, we're really genuinely called to live this out. Where do we go? And, and so as this morning as we open to Ephesians chapter 4, we find a wonderful answer waiting on us. If you look with me in verse 24, Paul has just finished telling the Ephesians, he said, these are the verses leading up to our verse this morning. We're going to walk through those just to kind of see the context here. Verse 24, he says specifically that Christians are no longer to live as they used to, but instead they're to put on the new self that's been created. That's the key word there, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And that right there is the basis for a series. That's why we can have a series entitled Real Godliness in Real Life. There's a new life that has already been created after the image of God, after the likeness of God. It's in true righteousness and true holiness. And it's not like a reforming or a cleaning up of the old self. This isn't something that we do on our own. It's not something that we earn. This is a gift that's been given to us at our new birth. We have, we, listen, we have already been given Real godliness, it's accessible to us in real life. And so that's, that's our encouragement this morning. As we come to these texts, as we look at these commands, that's our encouragement. We have genuine godliness accessible to us. And it's important to notice that immediately after verse 24 of this chapter, he doesn't, he doesn't begin to describe that union with Christ and, and, and that, uh, rather that new birth in, in mystical terms. He actually starts talking about it in relational terms. Verses 25 to 28 that we lead up to our verse this morning, he's talking about how the new self, through its invisible union with Christ, it's now, he, our new self is now visibly united in relationship with other Christians. Our new affection for Jesus Christ is expressed in how we relate to his body, the church. And so you see that all the commands that flow out of verse 24, they all, they all about life in the body. To put on the new self, to have real godliness, is to live in unity with other believers. Paul's emphasis on Christian community underlines all these commands. Look with me in verse 25. You'll see that the, the recurring theme is the church. He says he tells them to no longer lie, but to tell the truth. And the underlying reason for that is that because they're members of one another now. Verse 26, he tells them not to let the sun go down on their anger. And the reason for that is so that the devil has no foothold in their church. In verse 28, he tells them that they're to work hard now instead of stealing like they used to. And it's important to respect law and work hard. And that those are all good things. But his underlying reason is so that they can share with those in the church who have needs. And so that's the goal of all of these commands. Certainly, they, they apply to all of our relationships. But Paul's primary aim this morning in, in writing this command, the, the command we're fixing to get to, his primary aim, what's on his mind, is the health and growth of a local church. And we see that we each have a part to play in that process. We put off the old. We're, we're, to put, we're not supposed to walk the way that we used to. We put on the new, genuine godliness that's accessible to us, that's been created after the image of God, for the sake of the church. That's why we're doing these things. 
And so that's the broader context. The local church is what's in Paul's mind when he writes. That's his aim. That's the goal. So that's the context. And when, we, when you dive into and, and read a verse, you know, on its own, you always want to know kind of what's the context that it's in. This is what's on Paul's mind when he wrote it. So it's on his heart when he wrote it. And so when we, we read it this morning and we receive it as the church, that's what's got to be squarely in view for us, our local church. This, this is addressing our local church. And so with that kind of it fixed in our mind, in our view, let's approach this text together this morning. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Lord, make this true in our midst. The verse itself is very straightforward. It's probably a verse that you may even be able to rattle off. However, we can't be fooled. There's no, there's no pun intended here. This is one of those verses that really is easier said than done. And to, to, to wade into it, to wade into this verse and to attempt to obey it, is to voluntarily engage in spiritual conflict. It's to voluntarily engage in spiritual conflict. Obeying it means literally daily war. And so as Christians, even if we're very familiar with it, even if we have it memorized, we can't, we can't approach it too lightly. We can't approach it too carefully. Because the consequences are high. The consequences are high. Proverbs claims, literally, death and life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our pattern of speech is it's either going to flow out of one of two diametrically opposed forces. They're against each other. It's either going to come out of our old corrupt nature. It's going to be ruled and governed by our old corrupt nature, and it's going to be used to tear down. Or it's going to be flowing out of our new nature, our truly righteous nature. It's been created after the likeness of God, and it's going to be used to build up. Those are two forces that are against each other. So, but godly speech, godly speech is governed by that new nature. Godly speech is motivated by its effect on Christ's church. Godly speech is motivated by its effect on Christ's church. It's motivated by love for the gospel. It's motivated by a genuine care and concern for our brothers and sisters. That's what we see in our text this morning. And so following the previous commands that we've just walked through, we see that verse 29 breaks down into a similar, similar pattern to the other verses. It has two complementary commands. The complementary is the key word there. One's negative, there's a negative, and there's a positive. But they're two sides of the same coin. They're, 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 they're aiming at the same target, so to speak. Both are meant to serve the same common end, which is the good of the church. So both of these commands are negative. That's the structure that, that's the, structure the text breaks down into, and that's how we're going to follow it this morning. So, so those are our points. There's going to be two commands, one goal. Two commands, one goal. Negatively, we're to stop certain things. First part of the verse commands us to guard our speech. And positively, the second section commands us to, to, to cultivate certain kinds of speech, speech that builds up. And then the common goal, this is our third point, we do both of these things in order to give grace. That's why we do both of these. They work together. And so let's start with a point one, the negative command. We're, we, we must guard. We must guard against speech that corrupts. Right off the bat, we see this imperative here. It, 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 it conveys the idea of immediately stopping, like just stop immediately. This is, this is going on. It needs to stop immediately. It's not a conditional statement. And this is one of those instances where knowing kind of the original audience and the original church and just kind of being familiar with it kind of brings this text to life for us. It helps us to be able to relate to it. If you had a chance to visit the church in Ephesus, you would find on a Sunday morning a very diverse group of people. These are people who they wouldn't have been hanging out during the week before the gospel. There would have been Jews and there would have been Gentiles. And for, for the Jew, the Gentiles would have been those kind of lying, scheming people who are always trying to get away with stuff. They're pagans. And, and they probably would have been mostly right. But to the, to the Gentile, those Jews were those kind of self-righteous hypocrites, the people that are always talking about how good they're doing and looking down their nose at you, but really they're no different than us. And so that's, that's what would have been the case, and they wouldn't have been totally wrong in their view of the Jews either. But the thing they would have shared in common would have been open hostility. Paul had already addressed it earlier in the letter. There's animosity between these two groups of people. And so you see that they didn't see, this, they didn't see the world the same way at all. They didn't come from the same worldview. And you can just imagine how foreign this command would have sounded to them. This, this was so different than how they normally would have interacted. Before the gospel, 
um, that they would not have interacted this way at all. This, is, this is just seems like a foreign idea and a foreign concept. But instead of looking at their past, here's what's important to know about that. Instead of looking at their past and thinking, all right, well, guys, Paul, does, Paul doesn't ease up. He's very familiar with their prior history together. But he doesn't ease up. He doesn't say, hey, try to do, try to do a little better. No, he's keenly aware of what's at stake. He's keenly aware of the situation and the climate and the culture that they're walking out of into a new life in Christ, into this church. He knows what's happening. And it's precisely because of that that he, he goes kind of on the offensive and says, let no. He's very direct because of that. He, he, he commands them to diligently guard their speech. That's why he's commanding them to do it, because he knows where they're coming from. But here's the thing, though. The command can sound kind of radical to us, too, in 21st century America. The current climate that we live and breathe in is a climate of really biting social media posts. There's a lot of divisive rhetoric that's just thrown around, arrogant boasting, weightless kind of filler, juicy gossip that slithers its way around. Paul's command here can begin to sound a little foreign to us, too, in 21st century America. But like the original hears, whenever we encounter Whenever we're walking through the text and we encounter a command that sounds radical, just foreign to our ears, a command that, that seems just out of place in our culture, that's probably a clue we need to start paying a little bit more attention to it. If it sounds countercultural, we... Listen, here's the thing. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. It's going to require the same kind of countercultural diligence for us as it did for them. As we, we need to live out this high standard of our speech. We need to have a high standard for our speech, especially because of the culture that we live in. So if, if that's the case, if we have to be guarding against corrupting speech, it's critical that we understand exactly what, what do we mean when we say corrupting speech. Let no corrupting talk come out. What do we mean when we say that? I want to be clear at the outset, this, this, so this verse isn't twisted somehow. This verse does not mean that you remain silent in a situation where there's danger or where there's injustice. It's not what this verse is saying. You certainly need to tell the truth to the appropriate people to protect from harm, and you certainly need to speak up on behalf of the weak. Jesus is a perfect example of doing these things. And, and when you do that, it fits the second half of the verse. You're not disobeying the first part. You're actually fulfilling the second half of the verse that we'll get to in a minute. So that's not what this verse means, so I don't want that to be twisted. But with that caveat in place, we can't drive off into the other ditch either. We can't drive off and think, well you know, make it mean less than it actually says. It, it's easy to read a verse like that and think, man, I probably should try to stop cussing a little bit less. And, man, I, that dirty joke, I, I can't repeat that. You know, that, that's, that's what this means. Let no corrupting talk. That's what corrupting talk, kind of the category, it fits in and we put it there. But that captures, this captures, this idea captures a lot more than that. It certainly includes those things, but it captures a lot more than that. It's a whole way of viewing how we talk. It's a whole way of understanding biblically why we've been given speech, why we've been given language. A simple way to think about corrupting speech, this is, a, this is a simple way for me to think about it, is any speech that in tone or content is not governed by a care for others. Any speech that in tone or content is not governed by a care for others. We'll unpack what that looks like in a minute, but if that governor is not in place... If just that, that one thought is not in place, by default, here's what's going to happen. At least this is my own experience. It's so easy to just start to slide and coast back into corrupting talk. It just comes naturally to us. For example, think about this past week. Think about what was easy to talk about. What just kind of rolled off the tongue. What your conversations sound like. Did talking about yourself come very naturally? Was complaining sort of a default that you just kind of fell into? Was it easy to render a verdict on the shortcomings of your spouse? Did gossip or slander about someone in your small group just kind of slip in and it, it, it wasn't even noticed? Did you mostly, when you opened your mouth, did you mostly want to look cool or trendy or smart? Was that your aim? Were your snap reactions to your kids primarily reactions of frustration and anger? This is one that got me. I was writing it and it got me. Did you find yourself confidently commenting on people and situations that you're not really informed about? 
You're confidently making a decisive statement about a person or a situation that you don't, re don't really know about. That, that, was a, that was a telling one for me. That, that one was convicting. Listen, see, it's, it, you realize it's so easy to begin to talk this way and just accept what's going on around us as this is the norm without even thinking about it, without even, without even noticing it. Or if we do notice it, we're, we're somehow deceived a lot of times and we begin to believe that it doesn't really matter how we talk, that there's no big deal. Everybody talks this way. But we see in this verse, that's not how God views our speech at all. That's not how he sees it. If we could listen to a replay of our conversations, what comes out of our mouth, we'd see how serious that speech can be. Because listen, all those forms of speech, they're diseased. They infect. They're not sterile. They, they, they come out of... They don't just come out of our mouths and in there. They come out of a corrupt place in our hearts. And the second that it leaves our mouths, it goes to work in the, in the minds and in the hearts of those who've heard it. It begins to stir things up. Doubt, that, doubt and suspicion and anger and hatred and self-righteousness, all these things that possibly were dormant in the, in, in the hearts of the hearers, as it comes out of our mouth, it just begins to stir. Problem is this, while it's, it's still... In our, in our thoughts, or maybe a, a thought or a feeling that we have while it's still inside of us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have some sort of control over it. We have some sort of ability to put on the new self and exercise self-control. But get this. Once it escapes our lips, once it leaves, you've given that control away. Corrupting speech, wor those words, they're on the loose. And they're, they're looking to do damage. Trying to catch them and put them back in. Trying to corral them at that point. And, and keep, them, keep any harm from happening. It's akin to, to walking into, it's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous visual, but walking into a, a china store with a bull and turning him loose. And then saying, I'm going to get him back out of here without breaking anything. It ain't going to happen. You try to wrangle them, stuff's going to get broken. Here's the thing, once those words come out, that's what they're doing. They're on their loose. And you try to, you, somebody's going to pay for it. You or somebody else is going to, or maybe both of you are going to pay for it. It came from corruption, and its end is going to be corruption. It is a sobering thing to think that our words could have a rotting effect on God's people. It's a sobering thing. At a bare minimum, corrupt speech, it's going to harm your relationships. It's going to damage the community as a whole. It's going to blunt your witness to the lost people around you. That's just the tip of the iceberg. It, it, corrupt words, once they get loose, they, they can waylay huge swaths. They can devastate more than you can imagine. If I was to ask you, if you and I were sitting together, maybe over coffee or something, and I was to ask you, think about a moment in your life where words just wreaked havoc. Just absolutely, you know, just crushing things. You, you probably could vividly remember what people said verbatim. You could remember how it made you feel. You, you, you know those instances. That's what corrupting talk does. That's, that's, the, that's the kind of thing that it's after. Listen, for the sake of, of other people and for the sake of your own soul, give that kind of talk, give that kind of corrupting speech no quarter in your life. Deal with it before it starts to deal with other people and deal with it in a way that is just as ruthless as corrupting speech deals with other people. Deal with it in those, in those terms. It's your enemy. And remember this, it was corrupting talk in the garden that got us into this mess. It was corrupting talk to Adam and Eve. It's this question right here, the fallout from this question, this corrupting question, did God really say it was that question, right? The fallout still going on from that. Still happening. Bombs are still going off every day from that corrupting talk. We're still, we still haven't recovered. Listen, godly speech, godly speech is motivated by its effect on the church. We must guard our speech. So that's the negative command. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Now let's consider the positive side of that, the other side of the coin, the positive command. Remember, the, both of these commands, they're proactive. Even the negative command is a proactive command. Each of them is requiring us to think, and both are meant to serve the same goal. They're both working in the same, they're both pulling in the same direction. It's like 
a team of horses that you, you, you yoke together. They're pulling in the same direction. Point two, we must, this is the positive command, we must cultivate speech that builds up. We must cultivate speech that builds up. The conjunction that you see there, but, is this hinge. It's this massive hinge between these two commands. The idea is one of a strong contrast. Paul is saying, definitely don't do that, but definitely, definitely do this. So you get this idea that the command isn't only about just stopping things. Listen, the Christian speech, godly speech, it doesn't mean that we just bite your tongue and try to get to a place of neutral. Or that you're to just be seen and not heard. Because guess, get this, that still doesn't accomplish our aim. That's not pulling towards our goal. We're charting a whole new course. This is a 180. This is the way everybody else views speech. We're doing a 180 and, trying to, and seeing it totally different from God's perspective. Paul is saying this is a new course. So that means that we can't be satisfied. Listen, church, that means that we can't be satisfied with a low bar of weightless and aimless talk. Talk for the sake of talk. Instead, the Bible consistently elevates our view. It elevates our understanding of the value and consequences of our words. It elevates them above how we typically would view them. As Christians, we have a higher standard for our words because our words are meant to serve a higher end. There's a higher goal in place. God has a better design for how we speak. So how do we do that? How do we live out that design? How do we become people who are members of one another seeking to effectively serve each other through speech? So we're looking to build each other up through speech. How do we do that? Well, this next little phrase is so instructive. We speak as fits the occasion. Put it another way, we, we speak in such a way to try to fill in where there's gaps. Holes in the wall, holes in the defenses, fill in there. That means that buzzing over from 30,000 feet and just dropping some truth, hoping it lands generally in the area that it's helpful, isn't going to cut it. To be able to, to fit the occasion requires precision. It requires, it requires a lot more work than that. It requires effort. It takes sacrifice. And, and those are two things. Those are two words that we don't naturally tend towards. We don't lean in the direction of effort and sacrifice. We lean in the direction of, man, if, this, if it could just be easier and comfortable, and I could just push a button, that's, that's the direction I want to head. Well, that, that's not the case here. It's saying it requires effort and sacrifice on our part. So effort and sacrifice require want to. They require incentive. That's why we plan specifically for this sermon to follow, you know, in the sequence that it's going, the previous two. These sermons naturally build on one another, and if you haven't had a chance to hear Aaron's ex excellent sermon from last week on what it means to begin to work on the plank in your own eye before you begin to try to take the speck out of somebody else, go back and listen to that message. It really does set the stage for what we're talking about here. It gives us that incentive. It helps us, it helps us understand why we do what we do. Because as God helps you recognize and work through your own weaknesses, he's at the same time shaping you into a useful worker. He's shaping you while you're doing that. Listen, a proud, rigid person who hasn't went through that process, you're just, you're just, you're rigid. And so if you're asked to fit the occasion and bend and flex a little bit, you start to snap, you start to crack. But a humble heart, a heart that's aware of its own weaknesses, has come face to face with its own struggles with sin, and has experienced the mercy of God towards you and received that love, that's a pliable heart. That's a heart that can begin to fit the occasion. That's a useful worker in God's hands. I love this quote from John Newton. He's the, the man who wrote, wrote Amazing Grace. He says, Whoever is truly humbled will not be easily angry nor harsh or critical of others. He will be compassionate and tender to the infirmities of his fellow sinners. I love this. Knowing that if there is a difference... It is grace alone which has made it. It is grace alone which has made it. Listen, we, we have to be hearing and receiving from God before we're speaking to others. Hearing and receiving from God. Listen, his word has to be massaged deep into our, just our thoughts and our emotions and so that the springs that produce our, our speech begin to be a little bit sweeter. They begin to grow. Compassion be, can, can then begin to flavor our tone. Gratitude can, can help our words be more refreshing to the people who hear them. And so we read his word deeply. We spend time meditating. Maybe, maybe that, that means that you don't just run through it real quick and then run out the door. 
Maybe if it's one specific truth that you carry with you and you chew on all day long and you think about deeply that one truth that the Lord just spoke to you during your time with him in the morning, hey, keep it with you. Eventually, one day, as God works it into your heart and mind, it's going to be the truth that comes out right when your son needs to hear it. God will be preparing you as you go through that process. Read broadly. See the big picture of Scripture. Listen, you've, you've got to be able to see the glowing hues of Scripture, the promises and the glory of God on a grand scale so that you can walk people up to it and say, you see that right there? Look at that right there. Look at the hope that's there. Reading broadly helps you see that big picture. Read the stories of real people who faced impossible situations and how God over and over and over and over again delighted to show up. He delighted to reveal himself and to deliver. Think about people that need to hear those stories. Read the prophets. Hear the warnings that they, that they give to us. See the faithfulness of God that even when his people fail over and over again, God doesn't abandon his covenant. Listen, God breathed out 66 books to fit the occasion of our lives. He breathed out 66 books, not a few verses, to fit every occasion of what we needed. The sufficiency of Scripture is rich for us. And we need an ever-growing capacity as we read and we understand these things and, and God massages these things into our hearts and our minds. That's what comes out of us. That's, that's what we want to carry around with us to fit the occasion for other people, not just a few verses. He gives us a repertoire. So we want to read his word. That, that helps us fit the occasion. We want to spend time with him, receiving from him. Fitting the occasion also means that we speak to God on behalf of others. But we're trying to do this building project. It's supernatural. We need supernatural help. Possibly the most profitable words that you'll ever utter to build somebody else up will not be to that person. They'll be to God on that person's behalf. Listen, pray for others by name. We did it this morning during the pastoral prayer. We prayed for a person on the other side of the globe by name to, for the Lord to build him up. Pray for him by name. Pray for him in secret. Even from afar, you can lift their arms. Listen, there's never a time that praying for someone doesn't fit the occasion because there's never a time when they're not facing something they need you to be praying for them about. It always fits the occasion. Instead of talking about people behind their backs, how about we pray about them behind closed doors? Pray for them in secret, but also pray for them in person. Just hearing, hearing this phrase, hearing these words, let me pray for you. That, do, that immediately does something in our hearts and our minds, doesn't it? I remember running into a guy. I, I, we were having a brief conversation. It was a guest house overseas. And we'd been talking for a little bit, and he just stops in the middle of our conversation. and says, hey, man, let me pray for you. I'd never met him before. The guy just starts praying for me. And there was something about hearing him pray out loud to God on my behalf that just immediately built my faith. I was built up. I don't even remember exactly what he prayed, but I, that memory is so vivid in my mind. It was just an, one of those moments that just really encouraged me. Listen, pray for people in person. It, it makes a difference. It builds up as, as builds the occasion. That's one of those things that builds up. So we pray for people. But also, working to fit the occasion requires us to get to know other believers, to be in community with other Christians. Effective speech is oriented around the hearers. One way to consider others before ourselves is really to practice this good habit of asking intentional questions and listening. Unlike how easy it is to just say corrupt things, it, takes, it really does take intentionality to listen. It takes effort to listen. Stopping to listen, though, is a concrete demonstration of care. It is a concrete demonstration of care. Ed Welch says, talking about listening, he says, we're not listening. We don't aim to draw out problems so that we can be helpers. We're not listening so we can fix people. We're simply interested in knowing another person, which is a basic feature of everyday love. It's a basic feature of everyday love. So we want to know the whole person. We want to get to know them, and listening is the channel that we're able to do that. Certainly, you, you can't do that with everybody. You don't have time to do that with everybody, but don't let that turn into nobody. There's, a lot of times it's easy to think, well, I can't do that for everybody, but then it doesn't, that prevents you from starting with anybody. Start with the people that God has put immediately in front of you. When's the last time you listened to the folks in your home? When's the last time you, you really asked questions and you genuinely wanted to know how they were doing? Do you know what fits the occasion for the folks in your small group? If not, 
there's, there's, there's a place to start right there. People, people that you can listen to. And so you see that these steps, these first steps of fitting the occasion, they're steps of faith. They're steps of, steps of trust in God. Listen, you're gonna, inevitably, you're going to have growing pains. This isn't going to be easy. There's going to be times you don't get these things right. You're, you're going to be trying to obey it, and there's going to be growing pains. You're, you're, you're going to put yourself out there, and you, you might get rejected. You won't be as eloquent as you would like to have been in that conversation. You're going to leave that conversation and think, man, I wish I'd have sounded better. Perhaps, you, despite your best intentions, you're going to still end up saying the wrong thing and have to go back and apologize later. But these are steps of faith. Be encouraged by the, the people of Ephesus. Think about the Jew who knew the scriptures. He knew them inside and out, but he was clueless when it came to relating to a Gentile from a totally different background. He didn't even know how to talk to him. Think about the Gentile who's probably eager and excited in, in his new, new life in Christ. He's heard the gospel and he's excited about that, but he has no scripture or truth, nothing to, 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 to offer anybody. They had the gospel in common, yes, but, but getting to know each other and understand each other must have been quite a process. Imagine how awkward some of those conversations were. Imagine the effort and sacrifice that it took for them to learn to get to fit the occasion and to build each other up. They're folks just like you and me. But that's what these commands were intended to accomplish. They're intended to do something supernatural, to step by step help them grow up together. That was the goal of these commands. The sacrifice and effort that they were, were going to give to fit the occasion, working to fit the occasion, it was going to be worth it. It was going to be worth it. And it's worth it for us too. It's worth it for us too because here's the thing. Situations are everywhere. Right now, there's situations around you this morning. Some of them are in your minds right now. Think about what those situations are. Situations are everywhere that need you to help build them up. Listen, there's too much at stake, and there's too much to do to be satisfied with the status quo in this. We can't buy into, listen, don't buy into the speech light that's everywhere around you. Don't settle for the worthless conversations. Your brothers and sisters are daily under attack. Some of them are going under. We can't be willing to let that happen on our watch. They need you, and you need them. So what I mean when I say to, to wade into this verse really is to genuinely engage in spiritual conflict. It really is. These are real words. When Paul's talking here, he's thinking about real words. I'm sure he has specific situations in mind, possibly, when he writes this. He may know certain things about the, the people who are going to read this that he has in mind. So he, he's thinking, I want, I want real words. He said, I can't be there. So church, church, I got to do this. Look at me. Do this. These are real words for real situations that people are really facing. Real things with real consequences. What about your friend who lost his job and he desperately needs you to come alongside of him and to speak hope? What about that younger sister in Christ that you see the potential in her, but she needs somebody to mentor her and to help her see that? What about the person in your small group who's dealing with health issues again and they, and they need a word of comfort from you before, because they feel like giving up? They really want to give up. What about your child who needs to be reminded of the gospel as she wrestles with doubts again? What about your brother that you know is walking away from God and he needs you to warn him before it's too late? Listen, are, are you thinking about building? Are you thinking about building up? Are you plotting for your words to do others genuine good? Is it wrong to talk about the game or the weather or a movie that you saw? Absolutely not. Not at all. In fact, your friend probably, he's probably not going to open up to you about his job loss unless at some point along the way you talked about sports. That's just how he got to know you. So now he can trust you with other things in his life. But the point is that even in these everyday conversations, we don't stop there. Our eye is always on deeper waters. Our goal is always greater. Listen, our goal is to cultivate speech that builds up because people need that. Our church needs that. So those are the two proactive commands that we see this morning. They're, they're both in this verse. One's negative, one's positive. 
But remember, remember that these are complementary commands. They're working together. So, so you, we stop doing, we stop doing this, stop, you know, corrupt speech, and then we can we build up. Or we, our aim is to build up, and we do both of those things for the same common end. That's our goal. So here's the goal. Here's the objective. We speak to give grace. We speak to give grace. That's God's view of speech. We open our mouths to give grace. Look at the last part of verse 29. He says that it may, that it is, here's the reason. Here's why you do these things. That it may give grace to those who hear. That's the goal. This morning, if you're wondering, as as you're sitting here listening to this, you think this just feels overwhelming. I mean, to to do this, listen, I'm not one of those people who knows the right thing to say at the right time. I'm just, I'm just not that. It's very difficult for me to do that. Well, that's you this morning. This little phrase right here, this phrase, the very end of the verse, it's meant to give you joy in the process. As you walk through obedience, this, this is supposed to give you joy and build you up to do that, to lift you up to do that. Because here's the thing. All the effort towards building up, all, all, the, th- all the times that we strive to do this, it, that's, what we're, that's what we're after. We're after giving grace. I want you to imagine for a minute what it's like to just be independently wealthy. You have so much money that you could give it away to every possible cause, to every person in need, as much as you would like, to build up in order, in order to encourage, in order to do things, and it wouldn't put a dent in your bank account at all. Imagine those scenarios, right? Imagine being able to hand a scholarship to a, to a college student with tears in their eyes full of gratitude because they have a chance to go to school now. Imagine a, a scan that comes back clean because of research that you've paid for, you've helped underwrite. Imagine a Bible being handed out in a new language for the first time. And somebody has it because of a donation that you made. In those moments, you wouldn't think, man, this, this just seems like a lot of work. That work would just, that, that would drift away, right? It wouldn't be drudgery. It wouldn't be drudgery at all. It would be a joy, wouldn't it? It would be, it would be exciting, wouldn't it? It would be a rush. It would be a delight. We certainly, we, we need to be generous with our funds. We, we did hear that. But we're a people. We sang about it this morning. We're a people who have been entrusted. We've been given something greater than money to give away. Here's the thing. We've been entrusted with the riches of grace. It's been lavishly given to us, undeservedly so. We didn't do anything for it. The riches of grace have been lavishly given to us so that we can pour it out on other people. That's, it, didn't, it wasn't meant to stop with us. The grace of God has already given us. It's already given us every possible spiritual blessing in Christ. And one day it will bring us into the very presence of God where there will be every possible physical blessing as well. We will never exhaust God's grace. It will never run out in eternity. It will never fail, and it will never change. So why not make every attempt in every conversation to give as much of it away as you possibly can. Just grab, grab as much as you can and give it to people. And there's still more there. And grab more and give it to the next conversation and say, Lord, who, how, can I, how in this conversation can I give some more away? How can I give some more away? Because here's the thing. You aren't enslaved anymore to corrupt and meaningless talk. Amen. Talk that rots and steals and deadens and divides. That's the way that the world talks. That's the way that you used to talk. But that's not how you talk anymore. Because of God's grace in your life, it doesn't have a hold on you anymore. Your old nature has no right to define who you are and how you speak. Praise the Lord, it has no claim over us this morning. And in Christ, the Holy Spirit, he has set you free. He has set you free to use your words to enliven, to restore, to defend, to protect, to embolden, to build up. Treat that like the powerful and priceless privilege that it is. Steward it wisely. Use it purposefully. Give it away liberally. It's nothing short of a blood-bought gift. It's a blood-bought gift that you can speak to build up. Godly speech. Godly speech, not just nice speech, but godly speech, is motivated by its effect on the church. It's motivated by that. So what are some ways that we can make progress in this area? How can we grow? A couple of practical suggestions. First, practice self-control. Practice self-control. 
Don't trust yourself to say whatever comes to mind. It's self-confidence, not Godward dependence, that says immediately what it thinks. What other explanation is there for, for thinking that I just have to just jump in there and say something without even stopping to think, does God have anything to say about this at all? Or thinking, is this, even if it is true, even if what you're about to say is true, without even wondering, is this coming out of a place to, to care for somebody else, genuinely f- to build them up? Or stopping to think, does this even fit the occasion? Is this what they're even talking about? May, I mean, have you ever had those conversations where they're talking about something and you jump in and throw what you think they said? And you missed it by a mile. They were talking about something totally different. And the reason that you missed it, the reason that I missed it at least, is because I was spending the whole time thinking what I'm going to say, not listening to what they were actually saying. And I, I didn't fit the occasion. And so it, it needs to, speech needs to go into these categories of self-control. We, we have all these areas of our life that we think, well, this, this, this needs to be self-control. We, we have to have self-control in this area or that area. And those are, those are true. But for whatever reason, speech seems to be one of those areas that ends up back out here as if it, it has free reign. And the scripture says we have to practice self-control. Listen, you, you may still say the same, th- you may still end up saying it. But odds are, if you kind of run it through that grid a little bit, you're going to be more careful in what you say. It's going to be better worded, and it'll actually serve people in the situation. The person hearing it will be built up. Second, read Proverbs and read James. Neither of those books are going to pull any punches when it comes to speech. If James doesn't scare you just a little bit when it gets to talking about the tongue, then just give it a minute. Go back and reread it. Those warnings, they've served as a much-needed dose of reality sometimes for me. They've, they've, They've exposed speech that I, at one point in my life, I would have thought was harmless. But they've exposed it for the deadly arrows that that speech can be towards other people. It's revealed it to me. It's also shown me sometimes the true motives behind my words, and they're a lot uglier than, than sometimes I want to admit. So, so read Proverbs and read James and let those, when we're talking about it being shaped by the word, those are two books that can really help shape your speech. Third, work on gospel contentment. Work on gospel contentment. I know that sounds kind of random, but, but God's in the multiplying business. He's in the multiplying business, and so what what we're used to sometimes is I think of it, we have a new topic every week, real godliness in real life, and so we have these siloed areas of our life, right? This week I'm going to work on this. But here's the thing, uh, that that sermon several weeks ago on on gospel contentment, God God delights as you work towards those things and work towards a satisfaction in Jesus Christ and a contentedness in him. God delights to take that effort, our meager little efforts, and cascade them into other parts of our lives. Contentment is one of those areas that just has a cascading effect. Contentment grows up, and as, as it grows up, it becomes gratitude. And a grateful people become a gracious people. And a gracious people begin to speak gracious words to one another. That's, that's how that cascades. But here's the thing. The opposites prove true as well. The opposite is one of those deals where we're, we're less content. We're less content in our relationship with Christ. We, we start to believe that we need more. We have to have more, and so we start to strive for more, and our lives get a little bit busier, and a little bit, we, we, we work a little bit harder. An unhurried, satisfied, unsatisfied soul, that's, that's the sort of fertile ground. That, that, that's like, that, this fertilizer is perfect potting soil for gossip and grumbling and putting others down to just spring up in. It's amazing how those two things go hand in hand. They, they just spring up in that kind of environment. So those are the the three steps. Practice self-control, read Proverbs, read James, and and work on gospel contentment. They're kind of sequential. They they flow out of each other. Three steps that we can do to to make some progress in this area. As we close, I invite you to glance into the future. Future of our church. There are people. There are people that God is calling us to reach with the gospel. He intends for us to give away the grace that we've received. That's what he intends for us to do as a church. There's a generation coming up that God intends us to disciple. There are church plants. There are church plants that we don't know about yet that God plans to send out from among us 
so that his name will be proclaimed somewhere else. There are parts of the globe we prayed about this morning. There's parts of the globe, listen, there's parts of the globe who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. They've never heard it, and they desperately need us to joyfully go. But that will not happen. That will not happen if we don't guard our speech. Those things will not happen. They just won't if we don't cultivate speech that builds up in order to give grace away. In this life, we have a very small window to follow faithfully where God is calling us to go. We can't let words shut it. We can't let words shut it. We, we can't settle in this area. We can't settle. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up in order to give grace. So this, this morning... Far above everything else that we could consider. The very glory of God is at stake when we open our mouths. It's at stake when we open our mouths. And so for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, for his name's sake, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace, grace to those who hear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we delight in your grace. We delight in your mercy. Lord, we, we delight in, in knowing that our sins are forgiven. Lord, we rejoice in, in your salvation that you have given to us freely and lavishly. You have poured out grace upon grace on us. Lord, help us to be a people who are just fully aware of that. Lord, who are, who are seeking. Lord, give us, give us that control. It, help us, Lord. Help us in this area of our lives. Help us to have that self-control, Lord. And then give us eyes. Give us eyes that look out from ourselves and look to you first. Lord, that receive from you mercy and kindness. Shape us into people that, that are looking to build one another up. Because Lord, as you do that, Lord, you're going to move mightily. You're going to build your church. Lord, that's our greatest desire, to see the church of Jesus Christ built so that he receives all the honor in our midst. He is worthy. He is worthy to receive all the praise. Help our mouths to reflect that.